Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our UK Squirrel Accord webinar taking place during this year's Plant Health Week. This is an important National Awareness Week that includes the International Plant Health Day on the 12th of May, which is this Friday. There are numerous activities, communications and events taking place over the course of this week. It is coordinated by DEFRA and there are a wide range of partners involved. More information can be found on the Plant Health Action website. That is the Plant Health Action website and on social media using the hashtag Plant Health Week. Trees are an important type of plant that we all rely on, and it is vital we have healthy trees and woods for our future. Unfortunately, the introduced grey squirrel is damaging many ecologically and import economically important trees and casting a shadow over the nation's tree planting targets. Today, I'm joined by Ed Hewans from the National Forest, who will take us through the grey squirrel impact assessment methodology and recording sheet. This enables landowners and managers to understand the level of grey squirrel bark stripping damage taking place and is now also a requirement for accessing the Forestry Commission's WS3 grant for grey squirrel management. If you have any questions you wish to ask during the course of the webinar, please put them in the Q&A function to enable us to keep track of them and do use the chat function for any general discussions. I will now hand over to Ed to take us through this highly useful survey methodology that we hope will increase our evidence base. Thanks, Ed. Thank you very much, Kay. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, along to today's uh, Grey Squirrel Activity and Impact Assessment webinar. So as Kay said, I'm Ed Hyens. Uh, I work for the National Forest Company as a woodland advisor. Um, so today's webinar, the initial section, will be focusing upon the reasons behind the methodology, uh, the history and problems briefly caused by Grey Squirrels, and then we'll really deep dive into the methods, how to complete it, what the data is, how to record, and then steps following that. And as Kay mentioned, there will be time for questions towards the end of the webinar. Okay. So first of all, um, a brief introduction for those who aren't aware of the forest or haven't visited the forest. Uh, the National Forest is located in the Midlands. Um, we're between Derby, Birmingham and Leicester. Um, and we cover around 200 square miles. And that connects the ancient woodlands of Charnwood in the east and Needwood in the west. And this uh, graphic here outlines the key sort of uh, settlements uh, in the forest. So I work for the National Forest Company and we are an arm's length body of DEFRA and a charity that oversees the works of that make up the National Forest. So the creation of the forest to date has involved planting over 9 million trees, um, taking forest cover from one of the lowest in the country at 6% in 1991 to over 22%. Um, today. And uh, this change has transformed the area following the decline of the quarrying and mining industries that had left a scarred landscape in need of transformation. And through the creation of the National Forest, we've been able to support the connection of these pre existing fragments of woodlands across the landscape. In addition to uh, planting all of these trees, um, we've also com combined the sustainable development model of economy, society, and environment to create a connected network for businesses, recreation, tourism, um, and active woodland management supporting the woodland economy of the area. And one of the best examples of this transformation is um, a forestry England site called Hicks Lodge. Um, again, some of you may have visited there in the past. This was a former open cast um, mine and is now a thriving recreational facility in the heart of the forest near Ashby de la Zouche. Okay, so enough about the National Forest. Why, does, why, why am I here and why have the National Forest created this assessment document? Um, well, as you can see, we've planted over 9 million trees. And as the previous metric suggested, we've over 90% of these are broadleaf species. So ultimately, over the last 30 years, we've created an area that's allowed grey squirrels to, to move around and the damages have grown over those years. We will talk in a minute about the damages the grey squirrels cause. Um, but it's important, this document, to, to bring, on, bring, on, bring along landowners to the discussion about grey squirrel management, but also being able to monitor and be aware of what's going on on their land and we hope that through the rollout through this week with uh, the webinar today and a few other bits of uh, training in the future 
we can start to really inform landowners about what's going on on their land, working with the UK Squirrel Accord and other forestry organisations as well. Okay, so again, the next few slides are going to be a very brief uh, cover, cover of background impacts. Today's not about grey squirrel issues. Um, I'm sure lots of people on the webinar will be have a more depth um, knowledge than what I'm about to say, but this is just a very brief overview for landowners or participants that aren't aware. Okay. So the history of the grey squirrel, um, it was introduced intentionally between in the late 19th century, and it's now widespread uh, across the UK, having outcompeted and spread squirrel pox through the UK's native red squirrel population. The population of grey squirrels is now around 2.7 million, could be higher than that. And the UK red squirrel population has declined from around two and a half million to just over 250,000. Um, with populations in England being very much in isolated pockets and the majority of the red squirrel population being in Scotland or on islands. Grey squirrels are pro very prolific at breeding, so they will reproduce around twice per year, quite a large litter. So maintaining a population is, is or reducing a population is, is not always straightforward. Um, you do need a bit of a landscape approach, and it's this landscape approach and this informed landowner engagement that hopefully can start to see some real change to these numbers. Um, Within the national forests, again, we are we are thought to have that are towards the higher end of the density figure on the screen, at least at perhaps eight per hectare in areas, potentially above at times. Again, this is a, a well-known graphic um, showing this change over time for um, grey and red squirrels. So grey being the grey uh, portion of the map, the red being the red squirrels, and then the orange being the combined territories. If you can't see the uh, the legend on the screen. So we start off here at 1945 with red squirrels spread throughout the country and the grey starting to come up. And then as we go on for 2000, 2010. Now 2010, although it seems very uh, recent, was a while ago now. So this map is slightly outdated. There are likely to have been potential gains um, and, and changes in that time. So it's important to remember that. But this is just a real good visual indicator of the scale of the problem and again it comes back to to make real change for this um, we need to be monitoring management and research to move forwards into the future okay so what problems do uh, gray squirrels cause well the main problem is stripping of bark so um, stripping of bark will tend to occur between the ages of around 10 and 40. It's not uncommon outside this range um, and it is thought to relate to the desire for squirrels targeting sap or the flow of trees however there is ongoing research into this area to look at the exact science behind why grey squirrels show these destructive tendencies now once a bark um, sorry once a branch or a main stem has been stripped of bark um, the area can be lost entirely to bark stripping so once it's it's essentially it can ring bark the area this could be a, a, a lateral branch or it could be the main stem and it will essentially then kill that part of the tree upwards um, and secondary factors will then over time weaken that material causing it to snap out now that can also cause secondary concerns some landowners have quite popular sites or are using it for recreation for tourism whatever sort of diversification they've got and that obviously brings an increased threat to woodland users albeit small and an increased liability to owners so again bringing landowners on board with their objectives in mind there's a variety of woodland objectives out there but that could be uh, part of the conversation as well now there we go one of the main concerns of course, is the impact on the timber industry. Um, the reports suggest that grey squirrels are estimated to cause damages totaling around £37 million per year in England and Wales. Now that's a lot of money. It could be higher than that. Um, and you know, the, the more that grey squirrels are allowed to, to cause this damage, the higher the impact is going to become. 
Now, that's a direct cost to the timber industry. What it doesn't always take into account is the, the damage caused by the loss of what will become a mature woodland ecosystem. Um, and we'll talk a bit more about that in a minute. But what we can see on screen here is a mature, uh, well, an immature oak tree that's been uh, ring boxed. It's had its bark stripped from its main stem. The secondary factors, possibly weather, other, other factors have caused it then to snap out. So what will then happen is what's happening here, some, some lateral, excess lateral growth, loss of form, and ultimately the loss of value. Now, if this is happening to one or two trees in your woodland, it's a bit of a problem. If it's happening to your whole woodland or your whole estate or even a region, then huge swathes of immature trees are never going to reach that full potential. They're never going to be able to meet their objectives that they're intended to, to meet. And this will ultimately then impact on the woodland economy, the timber supply chain, and in the ways that we need to take back control of some of these um, areas over the next few decades, this is a significant issue. And these damages, such as this here seen on screen, um, can ultimately also lower the, um, the willingness and the desire for landowners to plant new trees. And at a time where we are pushing hard in the national forest and outside the national forest to increase woodland cover, for biodiversity, for climate, for timber security. This is a really important time to be shown that landowners, when they do plant trees, they can achieve their end objectives because that lots of them will be taking land out for farming into trees. And we've got to make sure that they can get their returns that they need. Okay, again, a very brief um, about wildlife and the gray squirrel's impact on wildlife. So gray squirrels will impact native wildlife. Discussed the red squirrel drop in numbers, um, squirrel pox, it continues to be a problem. Um, it's still, it still is a problem where we're looking to expand the ranges of red squirrels or protect ranges. Places like Anglesey, for example, you know, there's buffer zones there where reds and greys are interacting, the borders of Scotland around, you know, the, the sort of Merseyside coast. Uh, these areas are very important to be able to maintain that barrier um, and squirrel pox is a real threat in those areas. Um, they are physically bigger, uh, grey squirrels and red squirrels, and they will also potentially predate on songbird chicks. So this is a study done by Basque. Um, again, more information out there. But the whole biodiversity value of trees and woodland, as mentioned in the last slide, if, if we aren't going to be getting these mature trees, we're not going to be getting the, the future nesting habitats um, and the, the structural diversity um, will be impacted as well. So it's really important that we can monitor and make informed judgments within individual woodland blocks. If, if you're interested in more red squirrel um, information, then the new red squirrel strategy for England is published um, and is online for you to, to read through. So I would encourage that. Okay, so specifically tree impacts, um, species that are particularly targeted. So there's a list on the screen there. And squirrels will strip bark on coniferous species. But what we find, um, again, most of our work is focused in the national forest, but squirrels will tend to focus upon broadleaf trees and only really target coniferous trees towards um, when there's a lack of that population of broadleaves that they can target. Um, now, in the National Forest, we tend to have, um, as I said, 90% broadleaf planting. So our, our sort of ranking of damage would probably go, they'd probably, we tend to see they start off at birch, silver birch, um, different willow species, uh, field maple, and then progressing towards oak, which is quite commonly planted as our main final crop. Um, we see some areas of sweet chestnut, hornbeam, sycamore damage, uh, but in, they're in smaller quantities due to our sort of planting mixes that have happened over the years. It's likely though with, um, with the, the post ash planting mixes that are, are sort of progressing towards that 10, 15 year age um, range now that we might start seeing some more species becoming uh, more commonly damaged within the forest. Um, and you know, interested to hear different people's um, experiences of, of where damage occurs on their, on their areas and region. 
Okay, again, just to close off this section, quickly talk about current control methods. Um, this obviously links into monitoring your damage. You then want to be able to control. Um, they currently, gray squirrels currently have no widespread uh, predator control, so they do require human control. We, we saw earlier how quickly they can breed. So at the moment, we're looking at trapping, shooting, um, and in some areas, there is a small bit of predator control as well. Um, so trapping can be live cage traps, could be spring traps, could be kill traps. There, there's a variety out there and some you know, landowners and woodland management uh, folks on this call will have their preferences, ones that work best and ones that they know how to, uh, to best attract squirrels with. Um, what we tend to find is that shooting is, is more effective when you're using an active bait station. So it's drawing squirrels towards a singular point that you can then sit there and, and control them from there. Um, we also find that uh, courses for landowners, so there's a, there's a land for grey squirrel management course, you know, it can be quite good to, to engage landowners and educate landowners on the, the correct ways to set traps, um, to try and attract and control effectively. It's important to control effectively. You can control, but it's, it's doing the right steps that's really going to get the, um, the impacts that you, you desire. And there's a few uh, pictures of different traps for those uh, who are interested. Okay, so again, this is not a Pine Martin webinar. It was a very useful Pine Martin webinar that's on the UK Squirrel Accord uh, YouTube channel. So I would suggest you, uh, for anyone interested, go and have a look at that. Some really good studies on there. Um, but Pine Martins are never going to be the silver bullet um, approach for grey squirrels. They aren't going to come into areas like the National Forest where we've got high densities and be able to just overnight scare them off, predate them, predate them away. It's, it's, it's unrealistic. What they can be is part of a long term solution. However, with any Pine Martins, you've got to be confident that the reintroduction is suitable for the pine martins themselves, that the habitats can support a population, but also that it's not gonna have any adverse impacts on other wildlife populations. So it's really, it's really a, a balance and different areas are doing those studies at the moment. And again, I would refer you back to that UK Squirrel Accord YouTube webinar um, you can find online. The one last thing to mention about pine martins as well is that there's potential that you could then be hampered in terms of your efforts. So it could reduce or increase the labour intensiveness of um, things like live cage traps because you won't want to catch pine martins in your area, however likely that might be, um, but also then kill traps. So some of your tunnel traps, your spring traps, you, you've got to be careful um, if you've then got pine martins. Okay. And then another one of uh, great interest from landowners that you, you talk to um, and one that hopefully will play a big part in the future um, is the, the oral contraceptive work uh, being done by our APHA. Again, without sounding like a broken record, there's lots more information on uh, uh, webinars, again, on the UK Squirrel Accord YouTube channel, on the latest updates, everything is going to plan, um, but it will be a number of years until this is going to have an impact and be able to be used. Um, and it's also, again, only really going to be able to help lower that growth curve. So it will then be important to keep up on those traditional controls that I spoke about earlier to start doing these local um, extinction removals. Okay, that's enough background. Um, let's talk about the impact assessment method. So first of all, um, I wanted to mention funding. This uh, funding's a, a big driver for, for lots of landowners for obvious reasons. Um, you know, time isn't isn't cheap for, for anyone, whether that's the landowner themselves, whether that's them paying anyone. Now, at the moment, funding for the assessment, this is, funding for the assessment is not universal across the UK. It's only available in England. Now that might have changed since I, since I last um, was updated, but I'm fairly certain that's still the case. Um, so it can be funded, um, as Kay mentioned, through the Countryside Stewardship, uh, the WS3 option. Again, the full criteria is online, but this requires you to uh, put an application in. They're assessed by the Forest Commission, and there is a requirement then to complete a grey squirrel plan, an annual damage and impact assessment, which is what we're talking about today, um, and the annual call and effort returns. In the National Forest, we offer a um, standalone grant for the within the boundary only. Um, only unfortunately, if you're if you're outside of it, we can't fund your work. Um, but we have a wide ranging management grant. It's open every year. It includes squirrel control. It includes funding for infrastructure, so traps, bait stations, things like that. 
and it also includes the impact assessment as a as a mandatory option if you're if you're choosing screw control at all. Um, so this year, for example, uh, so 2023 to 2024, we have over 400 hectares within the forest actively controlling squirrels uh, through the grant. Um, and that again is trying to boost that landscape approach, trying to let these young plantations get away um, and minimise damage in the, in the process. <clears throat> Okay, um, so why monitor squirrels? Early recognition is particularly important for all woodlands, including those in the national forest. Um, many landowners, as mentioned earlier, are not from a forestry or similar background. They can't always recognize the issues. Lots are, but there's a, there's a, there's a shift. It's a, it's a skill, you know, forestry um, and, and pest management and all those things. Not everyone has a gamekeeper, not everyone has a land estate manager with some people have small blocks of woodland that they go and visit once a week. So it's important that we can make an easy accessible way for people to monitor damage. Um, so we want to be able to change, see those changes over time and be able to monitor how effective uh, those, those interventions are. Okay. So how can we monitor squirrels? We could count them, we could sit there and count squirrels. However, um, I don't know about anyone else, but uh, the idea of counting squirrels, um, which are you know, quite commonly quite skittish and do tend to look quite similar, um, would be quite difficult. And that would vary site to site as well. You could have a, a squirrel that is that is um, very used to people, you know, in a site like Hicks Lodge, for example, that I mentioned earlier, or you could have a site that's never really used to uh, members of the public and they could be even more um, afraid of humans so that's not ideal there is a method um, that would would remove the human interaction so the APHA are have developed camera trap method so again camera traps great that takes away the human element but it still doesn't remove the fact that gray squirrels look very similar um, and they're not a species like a jaguar, for example, where you can tell individuals by their spots. So not only are they highly mobile, but they are overlapping ranges, very difficult to see. The camera strap method has got a very impressive statistical analysis function and it does work. However, again, when we're looking at expensive camera traps on a scale and statistical analysis, this isn't what is going to typically attract the majority of landowners. So we need something a bit more straightforward. So impact, much easier to record. Trees don't normally move um, unless you're reading Lord of the Rings. Um, so they can act as a proxy for population. It's also potentially more directly relevant. So when we're looking at tree impacts, that can then inform woodland management, monitoring of um, part of a regular annual health check for the woodland, increasing knowledge and hands-on um, landowner or woodland manager interventions within each woodland block. And this means that data can be regularly collected. Um, it's fit in with these time constraints. So regular recording will create more data and more data will hopefully lead to better understanding of what's happening in the woodland and what can be done to, um, to mitigate against some of these issues. So the impact assessment was originally started um, by a former uh, National Forest employee when they were uh, doing their master's project. And over the years, it's been um, edited with some significant ed edits last year um, by myself and Dr. Heather Gilbert, uh, who's our evidence and research manager. Now, since the method has been developed in the forest, we are again very aware that we might be quite unique. Um, and we have already done some early trials last year, which I'll come on to talk to you on the next couple of slides. And the early feedback from those trials um, and some trials in Wales have been used to, to make this. Uh, method a bit more robust and ensure that the data is collected in the correct way. Okay, so before we, we jump into the detail um, on the method, uh, I just want to talk about those trials that I mentioned then um, last year. 
So during February and March 2022, uh, the National Forest Company commissioned a survey of 20 sites within the forest, best method, um, and many of these sites were trialled um, back in 2007. Uh, but the methods changed quite a lot since then, so they weren't directly comparable. Now the sites varied in size, as you see on the screen, age, and also ownership, which is um, it's a fact that we, we didn't we didn't necessarily drill down into too much, but obviously different ownership and different objectives for the sites will have then different potentially um, management over the years. So the results of this um, are now in this table on the screen. So what we've got is we've got um, the sites. So we've got one to twenty on on the left hand side. We've got their size in the in the middle column, and then we've got an average damage score. And we will come on to talk about how to calculate this average damage score. Um, that's the big part of the the uh, method itself. But what we can see here is we've got the maximum score of 13.1 on site 13. And we also have a minimum score of zero. We have a site that scored zero. Now, damage scores um, are, like I say, we'll, we will, we'll look at how to do those. But the score, that's, the, score that, uh, the site that scored zero doesn't necessarily mean it didn't have any damage. The way that the, the method works uh, it just meant that within the survey stops, there was no damage. Now, on second, um, on a second and third visit, we have found damage on this site last year when we went back and looked. So it does show that there are limitations to this method. We're not trying to get away from that. We are sampling at the end of the day. We are sampling just a few plots within woodlands that have got thousands of trees. Okay, so there's always going to be root margin for these these gaps in the data. And again, th this just hammers the importance of if, if you've got the more time and the more stops you can do, then the more um, more reflect accurate reflection of your woodland it will be. And we'll come on to how, how to do your stops in, in, in a second. Okay. So to conclude this section, um, the feedback from the survey team. So categorization level of moderate and severe damage that needed to be reviewed. Um, we specify in the document numerical values that reflect the limits to moderate and severe damage. And to test these, we did go out and we checked the boundaries and we, we gave our own sort of ground testing um, truth to that. And what we found was that we were categorizing some sites with, that had severe damage in that moderate category. So with that in mind, we wanted to change the boundaries so that it flipped it the other way, so that it was it was um, being more pessimistic, so that you were being told severe damage was there sooner, um, and therefore that informs your actions, so that we aren't telling people they've not got a problem, and then they aren't taking action soon enough. So those thresholds have changed. Um, and again, the, the consultant that did the, the test was very clear that different species mixes, different management strategies, and a whole other host of factors made comparisons between sites complicated. However, it gave a good uh, basis for looking at change over time um, when these, these factors will become less of an issue. With that in mind, the, the survey now, and the assessment now, is looking for fresh damage only. So, as we get on to talk about what you are recording when you're doing the assessment, you are looking for fresh damage only. So that's damage that you believe has happened within the last 12 months. And again, when we get to the pictures sort of end of it, I will show you what that, what that tends to look like. Now, again, talking about the National Forest, um, most woodlands are dominated here by broadleaves, as we said, 90% broadleaf planting. Um, and we find that squirrels show a very strong preference to broadleaves. Therefore, pretty much all of the conifer blocks in our woodlands in the National Forest were scoring zero. Now, this could artificially lower the overall damage score if some of your stops were have to happen in the, the, the coniferous blocks. Um, so there could be an argument for not including the conifers at all or for separating them out. However, what we would say is the recommendation is that landowners use their, and woodland managers use their site knowledge to best make that judgment. They are the best people. It's, there's no point in, in us sitting here and saying exclude or include. Do it once, make, make your judgment on whether to include or exclude conifers and stick to it. So the following years is that repetition that will be key. You've got to have that re repeatable survey 
that will then be able to give you that data so the change over time um, can be shown and your interventions can show their effectiveness over time as well. Okay. So how does it work? Come on, technology. There we go. Um, timing. So, first of all, when should you be completing this survey? When would we recommend? So, again, picking straight up off the last point, consistency is key. Whenever you choose to do it the first time, try and keep to that same time of year um, wherever possible. So, if you're going to do it in May, around now, could be a good time to do it keep doing it in May. If you're going to do it towards the end of, of, um, of the year, around sort of October time, keep doing it in October. What you've got to remember is you're looking for fresh damage. This picture on screen um, is, is a great example of that. So we've got um, some older damage here, and then we've got this, this fresher damage here on the, on the left-hand side of the, of the stem. Now, fresh damage is most likely to occur in spring. Um, Again, leading back to that phloem uh, theory of, of why squirrels are, are interested in, in spark stripping. And the other thing with spring out or autumn, the reason I mentioned sort of the autumn time is because when we get to the next few bits to look at the, uh, the assessment, you are usually looking up in the canopy. So when, depending on your, the size of your trees, the more leaf cover you've got, the harder it is going to be to spot that, that high up damage. Um, so again, choosing your, your timing is key. Okay, so the next thing to decide is where are you going to do it? Well, okay, so let's say that this is your woodland block. Now I can tell you that this is 11 hectare uh, compartment here and the triangles on screen show 11 stops through a, a transect route. Okay, so again, coming back, sound like a broken record, but repeatability is key. Um, that repetition over year on year. So where possible, mapping this transect, using a transect that's been formally planned, um, will give you that, that direct comparison. So you need one stop per hectare of woodland. Um, if your woodland is smaller than three hectares, you, you need a minimum of three stops. So that minimum of three stops is important because that minimum of three stops will feed into the uh, calculations at the end of your um, survey work each year and give you that that overall damage score for your wood okay the other key thing to do is to avoid internal ride networks so you can see again on this on this example we've got an internal ride network here with various sort of internal rides and this transect does cross them but it tries to avoid them it doesn't follow the ride network and that's important um, because the on rides the Ride, ride edge trees can have um, higher damage at times, potentially than, than internal trees. Okay. Um, if you've got a very large woodland or an estate where you've got distinctive sort of blocks of woodland, then you might want to split that obviously into multiple transects, especially when you've got one large block. So if you want to split it into multiple transects, then you might be able to split it over multiple days. You, know, you might not want to be out there doing this all day. You might want to split it into different times of, of day. Although if you are splitting into multiple transects, different days, then do try and keep those, those time frames very close by to each other again, because then you've got that, that accuracy in, in your data collection. Okay. So equipment, um, very little equipment is needed. Once you understand, once you understand the damage scores, which we'll come on to, um, that's the main point of, of the survey. However, a few bits of equipment can make it easier, depending on what you've got and depending on how, um, what sort of angle you're coming at this from. So you could uh, take out a GPS with you, for example. That would then help uh, record and replicate survey stops for multiple year surveys. So similar with the transects, mapping it out. If you can um, use your GPS to, to get the exact spot, then you, you've got a good um, idea. Binoculars, so as you can see on this picture, using binoculars um, will help, especially once your trees are starting to reach that, you know, um, people's eyesight can't always see straight into the canopy, so it will help. Um, a tablet, um, so to record the data for this assessment, there is an Excel workbook, 
So a tablet could be used to um, record the data straight away and saving time of printing out data sheets and then inputting manually once you return to the office, the car, wherever you, wherever you wish to input your data. Um, the, other, the other small bits of uh, useful kit could be that you could uh, potentially have, um, I don't know, stock markers, tree tags. They, these have been suggested by people doing the survey before. So you, again, you've got that rep, uh, repeatability of uh, the survey and the exact stop. That again comes down to woodland owner preferences, surveyor preferences. It's finding that that balance that works for you, what equipment works for you, um, and again repeating that as you go along. Okay. Um, so this is called the activity and impact assessment. So before we go on to the impact, we'll just talk about the activity indicators that um, you'll be looking for. So each stop in your woodland is identified on that on that transact map. Um, you are asked to look in a 30 meter radius from the standing point uh, for feeding sites. Now, this is likely to be very low, and it's also likely that it's not always going to be achievable. So you will have areas of high undergrowth, brambles, etc., that you won't be able to see these feeding, uh, feeding sites, even if they are there. So this again is more about developing that knowledge of activity within the woodland. It doesn't feed in to the overall damage um, and impact score, which is what um, the other side of the, the assessment will. So that 30 meter, that 30 meter radius, um, we're looking for tree stumps, exposed branches, uh, things like the, the picture on screen, um, you know, uh, broken into nuts, um, acorns, pine cones, things like that, that have, have, that have been left and look like a feeding site. Again, record it. If it's not practical, as it says on the screen, enter non-applicable, move on to the next stop. If it's recordable there, great, get an idea, move on, okay. Second activity indicator is drays. Um, so drays are normally spherical balls, of twigs, leaves can be found sort of woven into them. This again is another area where if you're using binoculars on your, as part of your equipment, could be very useful to, uh, to have on you at this point. It can be confused with bird's nests, not surprisingly. Um, it's a, a group of twigs in a, in a tree. Um, so only record if you're sure. Um, and again, once you, if, if you're unsure again, you might want to go and read more about drays and how to identify them. And then, <clears throat> pardon me, and then you, you, you can do this with a bit more confidence. Okay. So they're the two activity um, indicators and I'll show you on the recording sheet where to record those. So just briefly, um, before we move into the uh, impacts, we'll talk about squirrel, squirrel versus deer bark stripping. So squirrel damage to trees is usually bark stripping uh, and can be differentiated from deer or rabbit damage. So an easy way to differentiate damage is based on height. Um, deer and rabbits will cause damage under one, about 1.8 meters around that area in height, whereas squirrels will cause damage all the way over the tree, all the way up and all the way down. So to be able to differentiate damage at the base of a tree, the best way to look is to see if the bark's been discarded on the floor or eaten. So squirrels will discard the bark, whereas rabbits will eat it. Um, and deer damage could be from browsing of the bark or fraying. So it could, it, it, again, once you start seeing, learning the pictures and, and the signs, be able to start identifying it as different. But that over 1.8 meters is usually uh, a good a good indication. And then again, it's, so it's this it's this skill for looking a bit further down. And once you, once you get that eye in, then you'll then be able to see it. Okay, so we're looking for squirrel impact yeah, impact indicators. Um, so each stop in your woodland, so that could be, as I say, a minimum of three stops. So each of the stops. We want to stop and identify the five closest trees. So the five closest trees um, you will then put on the recording sheet. Now the five closest trees for this survey needs to be greater than seven centimeters dph. So those, that's diameter at breast height. Um, this has been put into the method uh, on the latest uh, changes to account for natural regeneration um, and anything below seven centimeters Typically, it's probably too immature for squirrels to have taken interest yet. Not necessarily completely, but typically. Um, 
Now, once the five trees are identified, the next step is to write down the uh, species of each tree. Again, this is all on the, the survey record sheet. And then it's best to take each tree one by one, um, give it the full 360 view. So walk around the tree, take a long uh, step back and look at the tree, look at the, the basal damage. So it's around the base, mid stem, and then the crown. So we've separated into the three areas, nothing more than that. Again, it's just, that's more for indication of where the damage was. Um, this is where binoculars could come in handy for looking up in the crown, the canopy, um, because it's much easier to see, especially as leaf, uh, as the leaf material starts coming back around this time of year. So on the recording sheet, there'll be a cross box for the three different areas. If you've got damage across all three, tick all three. If you've got it across two, then two, then so on and so forth. Okay. Um, and then once you've got the location of the damage, it's then scoring that damage zero to five. And that will, we will now look at that in a second. Okay, so this is a blank uh, example of a data collection sheet. So this is one of the print sheets. Um, so on the Excel workbook, which we can look at later, um, it has a print sheet, it has a summary sheet, and it has a data input sheet. So this you can print off um, as many as you need, fill out the stop number, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and so on, so forth. And then you've got your tree numbers here. So you could have oak, sycamore, birch, willow, field maple, for example, um, where the damage has occurred on that tree and then the damage severity score. So there's an example one up here. So it's oak, mid stem and crown, damage score of four. They've seen two drays at two feeding sites. Now, uh, the drays and feeding sites are for the whole stop. So in the comments, you might want to put comments about each tree. You could put comments about has there been recent management works in the area? Where are the drays in sort of rough uh, directions or, or meters? Um, and then that could feed in back into some of the management work against, you know, to control the squirrels. Okay, so zero to five, that's the, the most important thing. Now, some of you may have immediately noticed that pictures on the screen are of old damage. And what we are actually looking for is fresh damage. So that, that will be changing. Um, at the moment, we just haven't had time to collate images of fresh damage for zero to five. So zero isn't on the screen um, and zero is for no damage. So no visible damage. <clears throat> and then we start from left to right. So one is a coin or nail sized tend to be exploratory bark areas being stripped. So areas that look a bit like this. A two is hand-sized pieces of bark removed. So something a bit like this, quite common. A three, I don't know if this picture is coming out very well on the screens, um, but it's not particularly great in front of me. Uh, this is less than 50% of the canopy being killed. So it has potential to kill less than 50% of the canopy, the damage. Number four is it has the potential to kill more than 50% of the canopy. And a five would be it could it's got the potential to, tip, to kill the total canopy. So this is the point where subjectivity will come into it. And again, it comes back down to individual woodland owner, landowner who is completing the survey. So the differences between a two and a three and a three and a four are perhaps some of the most common um, areas where disagreements might happen. But disagreements aren't always um, a problem. It's it's your judgment, so it's your judgment between the two and the three. Now, what's the most important thing is if you think a certain size of damage is a two, the next time you see that certain size of the damage, it's still a two. Okay, we aren't going to start getting out and measuring hands of surveyors and and um, and doing low, you know, detailed measurements. This method has been designed to be a quick method that you can put a, a number of zero to five against each tree. And that that then feeds back into a wider sort of recommendation for the site. Um, and again, this will this will start to become a bit more um, natural and quick once you've done a few test sites, once you've done started doing your own samples, and you're getting your eye in for the different sites of damages. Um, okay, so in the in the spreadsheet that we will look at later, the the damage for each tree. 
as seen on this one here will then feed into a separate worksheet where it will calculate the average damage score. So the average damage score, if it's free or below, what the damage score is telling the landowner or the woodland owner is that the damage is low enough at the moment that it's not yet, not yet having a significant impact on the trees. So it's not, it's something to, to bear in mind. Obviously the higher the number is towards free, then the closer you are to that tipping point. If it's five or above, then damage is having a significant impact on the woodland and the woodland's declining in form and health. Now, that's when obviously you really want to be taking some serious efforts. And again, the higher the number, the more um, heightened your, your concern should be. So what I thought we'd do now, if possible, I can see there's nearly 100 people on this webinar and this may or may not work. In a in-person training, we would now sort of pass around some, some handouts and look at different examples of tree damage and try and attain what number we best would give that tree. So the image on the screen here, um, what sort of number would you give to this, um, to this tree from the to zero, zero to five? Well, we can see it's not gonna be a zero and it's very unlikely to be a five. Now we can't see past this picture. This picture is being taken as a one point perspective. Um, we aren't on the site, we can't look up and down, we can't walk around it. So we have to take it on that this picture here is the only damage on the tree. So if anyone's got um, any thoughts on what number they would like to give it, then pop it in the chat and we can, um, if anyone's feeling confident enough to give it a go. There's no wrong answers. Um, again, it's subjective. Great, so we're getting some answers. Yeah, so the answers that are coming in are between, mainly between a three and a two. Perfect. Okay, so in my, oh, still got a couple more. Yes, it's just the fresh, uh, fresh damage that we're recording on the survey. Um, so in my, in my judgment, if I was, if I was going out and surveying this tree, I would assign it a two. It'd be very close between a two and a three. Um, my two would be given on the basis of the two, the description of the size of damage for two is, is slightly ambiguous. So it says hand sized areas. So you could read that as it could be multiple sized hands. Um, and like I say, we're not going around measuring hands. Um, but the, the three suggests that it is large enough to kill less than 50% of the canopy. Um, I would say that that's perhaps not at that point yet, but it's very marginal again. So if you're going to score it a two, then you'd score similar sizes as that a two. If you're going to score it a three and vice versa. Um, all gender of hands. Yes. Very good point. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. So there's a couple more of these. If, if we're happy to, to do it again, then we can, we can run for a couple more. So the next one, come on, where is it? Oh, yep, is that on screen? Yep, okay, great. So again, it's a zero to five. Um, we've clearly got fresh squirrel damage here, so it's not a zero. Um, and I would say it's definitely not a five as well. So see what numbers we get this time. Okay, so yeah, we've got um, people coming in at threes, lot, lot, probably the majority are coming in at three. We've got maybe a four here and there. Okay, it seems to have slowed down. So um, yeah, again, we're between three and four here. Uh, majority of people are. I would, again, this is my judgment as if I was surveying this tree, I would score this as a three. Um, I would say that this is, list. I think you'd be pushed to say that these are hand sized areas of bark. Um, there are multiple areas here that are bigger than hands. But also, you've got, um, so I would score it a three. I think it's somewhere between, you know, a, a strong three. It's, it's got the potential that it could kill. 
you know, as, as the best estimate, maybe 20 to 30 percent of the canopy. It could kill none of the canopy. It, you know, the, there's still large areas of that bark all the way around the tree from what we can see that still have their bark. So, it, but the, the areas itself, the damage itself, and that one point, that is quite a shocking amount of damage. So, you'd, I'd score that a three. Um, and that'd be my personal viewpoint. Three and a half, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, in, in, the, in the recording sheets, uh, a point 0.5 is not, um, it's not wise to put a point 0.5. Um, so it's best, like I say, if you're going to score something a two and something a three, you get those boundaries in your head um, to move forward. Okay, next one. So again, we're not going to be a zero. And we're, yeah, I can fairly well say we're not going to be a one on this one either. We don't know what's going on around the back, which could be quite important on scoring this tree in, in the field. It's quite a immature tree. We've got damage all the way up. Um, so let's see what people are saying. Yeah, there seems to be a good consensus on this one. Okay, again, we have sort of gone up in, in scale. So uh, I did put them in a, a nice friendly order. Um, I would score this a four. I would say it's it's fairly solid four. Um, the the bark stripped here has all happened in one in one go. It's very fresh by the looks of it. Now the important thing to remember here again is that the wording of of the four and the five. So it's a stripped area large enough to kill fifty percent of the canopy. So it's not saying it has killed fifty percent of the canopy or more. It's saying it could. It is large enough. So what happens to this tree over the coming weeks, months? We don't know when this picture was taken. It looks sort of a summary time picture. This damage could have very recently happened. What happens next is important. That is a large, a very large area of the main stem there, the trunk being, being stripped of bark. Um, and if that's happened around the back and in large portions, obviously we can see a bit of, a bit of bark here up the side, but if the, if the back end is also been stripped, then we could be looking, moving towards that five, Okay, and then the last one um, before we move on from this section. If everyone's keen to participate again, this is the last one. Um, remember, we are looking for fresh damage on this one. Um, you will see there is there is old damage in the crown. Okay. So we've got a few different answers here. This is um, likely to cause a bit of a bit of a change in um, yeah. So what we have here. So. What we have here is a, is a patch here in the middle of fresh squirrel damage. Okay. Um, so it's mid stem fresh squirrel damage. I would score this a two hand sized area of bark removed from tree. It's, it's above a one. Um, you could argue it again between a two and a three, but I would say on the size of damage gone, that that would be a two. Um, you can see that this damage, this damage in the crowns already caused potentially a bit of Bit of canopy loss, it's either on this one or, or ones behind it. This woodland in particular was very badly affected. It's about a 15 year old um, wood, but it was planted in two different parts on a farm, probably about half a kilometre apart. One, one portion of the woodland very badly damaged by squirrels, the other portion is yet to be damaged. So it's, it was quite, it's quite an interesting comparison for this side. Okay.
I agree that the, the picture isn't always the best, but I can assure you that was fresh damage um, having been to that site myself. Um, but thank you for the comment. The, okay, so this therefore is then what would, what would happen from a free stop, a free stop survey. This is your data recording sheet. These are inputted figures, um, quite severe figures that I've inputted here. Um, just an example. So we have uh, the stop number, we then have the tree number, we then have the species. Okay, we then have where the damage occurs, and then we have the damage score. Drays for each site, feeding sites for each site, comments if you wish to put them. So the comments could be for the person doing the survey to hand back to the landowner or to the woodland manager, it could be for the gamekeeper to talk to the woodland manager, it could be whatever interaction, it could just be for personal record. But they are more for a personal basis. The main figure we're interested in here is this is this column here. Okay, so this will provide the necessary data towards the um, the back end, which is the summary sheet. Okay, there is also, as I mentioned earlier, and I showed you the, the principal field sheet that you can use if you're not using the tablet in the field. So the summary sheet looks something like this. Um, the green boxes are for you to complete. Um, the most important green box is the number of survey stops. This needs to be filled in for the uh, calculation to work. And then down here, we've got a total of the damage score, total of the drays, and then we've got an average for the site, which is the average per stop. So again, that's feeding back to the, um, the, the tipping point of our criteria of three or below or five or above. Um, so the, the average score here is clearly above that. So we've clearly got a significant issue with this woodland, which is what you'd expect if you look back at the previous slide. We have scores pretty much all twos and threes, a couple of ones and only one zero. Now it's very unlikely, hopefully it's very unlikely that you're going to find many sites like this. Um, but it's fairly obvious even before you get to the, the damage input that when you're stopping and noting that pretty much all five of your trees at each stop have got some form of damage that you are having a problem within that woodland. Okay, so this, this and the actual survey document, the assessment document are both available online. They are available on the UK Squirrel Accord website, they're available on the National Forest website, and they're available on the Countryside Stewardship WS3 website. So they are out there, they are ready to be used. Um, as I said earlier, they aren't they aren't going to be perfect. They will be. They will probably be able to be broken by people across different areas of, of the UK. Um, but any feedback on small changes that we can make to make this more robust for people uh, will be greatly appreciated as we move forward. Um, so just to summarise, uh, one stop per hectare of woodland is required to give a representative sample. We want the five closest trees, and we want the surrounding 30 metre radius per stop or activity indicators. If your woodland's three hectares or less, we still need those minimum of three stops. Okay. The results should be recorded using the survey sheets and that will then do the data collection and the summary for you, for you automatically. Uh, if possible, always record the route of travel through the woodland to enable surveys. Not necessary, however, following a similar route will increase that repeatability and the quality of data collected. I remember the same trees might not be present each survey stop if, if management has been occurring. Okay, um, thank you very much. That is the, the web address for where the, the assessment and the workbook, it can be found on our website, but it's also on the UK Squirrel Record website. It's also on Countryside Stewardship as mentioned. So we should have plenty of time for questions. That's great. Thanks very much, Ed. Um, that was brilliant. Um, before we move on to questions, I just want to highlight that there's a free in-person training session on this methodology that Ed uh, is delivering next Friday in the National Forest as part of Invasive Species Week. Um, there are still places available if you want to take part, um, and a list will be made of anyone interested in this training uh, but can't take part next week, but for future dates. Uh, so do email forestry at nationalforest.org. That's forestry at nationalforest.org if you are interested either next week or in the future. Excellent. Uh, so I have been having a look at the questions. Um, uh, one says, will goshawks affect the grey squirrel population? 
Um, it's not an area of uh, particular knowledge for me. Uh, again, it will be a, a small impact. They will probably predate. I mean, there might be someone in the chat who knows better than me, um, but it's not going to have a significant impact on populations. No, I know uh, there was a, 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 an Emma Sheehy wrote a paper um, and in, the, I think it was in 2015, and in that they did a study, uh, there was a study within that for, it, that was done in 1998 of goshawks in Wales that found that grey squirrels accounted for 10.8% of the biomass they ingested. I know that's quite a long time ago, but it was the fourth most important species. Um, but it, I guess it depends if you've got goshawks in your area and what other prey, because there was um, they, were, they detected 47 prey species. So I guess it depends on what levels of other prey there are and what areas you're in. Um, uh so uh so just just can you just repeat ed where you can find the sheet just in case anybody missed it uh yeah so both the recording sheet and the assessment document um which i can bring up if i can exit this um are on that that web address there uh, www.nationalforest about research um towards the bottom of the page is where is where you'll find the whole section on on the methodology brilliant thank you at what point does the squirrel damage impact timber quality? And is this reflected in the damage score and impact rating? Um, it's, it's reflected to a degree. Um, if, if you're asking when, when does it start? Has it got a financial implication in terms of the damage score? No. Um, the idea is that it's a quick um, survey showing when that, when you should as a, as a woodland owner or woodland manager be taking that action to to increase your efforts or to start your efforts of uh, greater squirrel control. Ultimately, once you're getting towards those sort of fours and fives, well, definitely want, in terms of the damage score zero to zero to five, if you're getting anywhere above a two, really, then it's affecting your timber. Even at a two, you're probably uh, getting a, a timber devaluation. Thank you. Um, it has been mentioned that it could be something that could be added. Um, so if anyone's ever, if you're interested in doing that research project, then <laughs> do get in touch. Um, in your sampling, where there is one site with zero damage, was there any grey squirrel management going on in that site, or was it down to a particular species of tree on that site? Um, that is a great question. Unfortunately, I don't know the answer to that one. Um, my colleague, who's not here today, whose name's on the screen, um, she oversaw the trials, and I don't particularly know the ins and outs of the, the results from that um, but I can find out if it's of interest. Yeah are there other sites with similar that um, where you've got zero damage because you've got good gray, gray squirrel management or, or you've got species yeah, that so you're not interested in? In general uh, in general the, the, it's, if there are sites in the forest where great you know early early squirrel management's happened and they've kept on top of it and that's really showing now as they're sort of reaching that 20 year mark um so you can really see the impacts if you wanted to compare sites in the forest you can really see the impacts that great squirrel management have um, has been having um you know some sites catching 150 squirrels maybe north of that a year um there's specific sites where a large quantity of the oak is snapped out um and, and yeah and is now nothing more than probably long-term firewood. Um, so yes, great score management is always, would always be recommended from our point of view. Yeah. Um, what's the point of this type of scoring when all, when we know, all, all know most of these trees will be kind of beyond their usefulness. Um, and more importantly, what about widespread damage to the upper side of lateral limbs in the upper canopy of mature trees, for instance, especially in relation to public safety, which is a big issue for local authorities? Yeah, again, um, so that's where your binoculars are going to come in. The, the older your site, the, the more you're going to have to be looking up um, and, and looking at those, the highest higher up bits of damage. We definitely do monitor those. We haven't separated it out from canopy to, you know, lower canopy um, purely because it's it just adds more steps. So any damage you can see, add that into your um, your scoring. So what was the was the first one about um, the, the higher the score than the but what, which is what's the point of this type of scoring uh, when we know most of trees, these trees will be on being useful, I guess, in the future or, or will be damaged beyond repair? You know? 
So the main point, the main sort of use of this survey really is to try and bring some landowners along the journey. Uh, not everyone has that background of being able to identify squirrel damage. And yes, the, the more gone it is, the, the less likely your control is going to have an impact. Um, but then there's obviously, if, if your if your control is coming out really bad or your score, sorry, is coming out really bad, then you might be looking at different interventions. You might change your management of your you know, compartments to copy certain areas, replant certain areas. The whole, the objectives of your woodland are very individual. So if you've got an, uh, a long-term aim for timber, then you're going to want to be controlling. Um, if you've got a long-term aim for wildlife and you've got 90% of your oak trees are snapped out at the top because there's been no control, then realistically, you're probably going to be looking at some other types of management. So again, being able to identify that, damage is important for whoever's managing that woodland. There are lots of people out there that don't have this knowledge or don't have a, a regular gamekeeper, a regular woodland manager coming around looking for them. So while some of this is, some damage is horses bolted, lots of it isn't. So it's important that we focus upon the stuff that isn't. And we might be able to collate some of this in, this evidence in the future and look at where the damage is worse across the country. Uh, we're hoping to create an, an app um, in, the, in the future that will provide online uh, recording. And yeah, maybe we'll be able to see where the hotspots are and where the grey squirrels are really having the worst impacts and whether that's related to uh, numbers or lack of grey squirrel management, etc. Yeah, yeah. So we'll be able to build that sort of data set and that picture, um, which is you know, and again, the more people use it, the, the the greater that will be. And the repeatability, the fresh damage is designed that then we will be able to see hopefully where interventions are making a difference in terms of um, where that damage score is changing over time. Yeah, the £37 million pound, uh, figure uh, that uh, was based on NFI, National Forest Inventory data, and that data only classes grey squirrel damage as above 1.8 metres because of the amount of things they have to survey. So anything below that, that is just classed as herbivore damage, but as, as we've seen from the pictures that Ed's shared, there can be a lot of grey squirrel damage lower down uh, and from the bottom all the way up through the tree. So, um, so that figure could actually be much higher, and that figure was based based on um, the trees that were lost, replacement trees. But um, I know somebody picked up the idea, comment about carbon sequestration. That, that figure was also based on the lack of the loss of carbon sequestration because of the damage to the trees. Yeah. Um, is the WS3 rate per hectare a one-off payment or five annual payments? Um, it isn't clear in the guidance and Annex 2 multiplies everything by five, much of which shouldn't be. So I am sure, unsure. <laughs> Um, WS3, I mean, that's not necessarily my grounds. No, I'm not. Is there anyone online? Who can, <laughs> I know there's someone online who could answer that, but um, I, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a he per hectare payment for an annual fee, as far as I was aware, fifty pound a hectare a year. Um, yeah. Yeah, I haven't actually applied for it, so I haven't. I, I just know that no, that's what it is. No. Um, um, within the forest, we use our own grant system, as mentioned, so it's. Um, Yes, of course. Um, there we uh, go. There you go. Rebecca, I said, from <laughs> Forestry Commission has answered that one. <laughs> yeah. um, is there an ideal woodland to survey in, i.e. just thinned or semi-mature? Um, again, it's to a degree, it doesn't matter too much. Um, you're looking for individual change of damage over time. So whichever type of sites you've got, those, those interventions will and the change in age will eventually still feed into your data in a way. Um, so it's not really an ideal site. Uh, it's more focusing on the sites that you either control or own or, or volunteer at or, you know, are interested in. If you've got a local site and you want to start surveying it, then, you know, by all means. Um, yeah, it's, it's more about being able to monitor that damage and take action post, post doing the monitoring. Yeah. Uh, what do we do with the data going forward? Is it just to give us an idea of volumes of squirrels to aid management? Um, so that sort of feeds back into what, you, what you've just been saying, there, okay, that about, you know, building this national picture, increasing our data sets. Um, it, is, it is primarily to aid, as I say, landowner, woodland manager interventions and knowledge about that. Um, planting 
I mentioned earlier about you know landowners and farmers planting woodlands with all the best intentions and wanting that long-term objectives to help wildlife grow some timber etc but if they aren't monitoring or if they aren't aware then there can be you know adverse consequences for them and for the sector as a whole you know it can really damage reputations of of wanting to plant trees and, and willingness in, in in farming or or any kind of landowner sector to plant trees um, which is what we want ultimately to achieve is greater woodland cover so yeah it's it's important thank you uh, what happens if a transect route goes through a recently failed area do the stops still remain the same are we talking clear fell or, or thinned? It just says recently felled. Okay. Well, in a thinned area, then um, you would still go to the same spots, but your nearest five trees would change. Um, and, and that would be reflected upon the scores. Um, so again, you'd probably just put a comment that the nearest five have now moved, recent thinning works, etc. In a clear fell area, um, I would say you would probably move that or skip that stop. Would you? I don't know. It's not a, it's not a problem that we tend to have. Um, depends on depends on how many stops you've got. If you've only got you know three stops and one of your stops all of a sudden is gone, I would suggest perhaps trying to find a nearby stop that's possible. Um, the whole woodland's been felled, then you've got no stops at all. You've not got a problem with squirrels if you've not got any trees. Um, yeah. Thank you. Uh, where bark stripping takes place at the base, is there a way to identify if deer or rabbit may have done this? I know you covered this a little bit, didn't you? Yeah. So again, anything above sort of one point eight meters, you, you, you find to presume squirrel. Um, anything below that, there's the, there's the chat about. Whether it's been discarded on the floor or whether it's been sort of eaten, that tends to suggest. Um... Yeah, because you can often, well, it's not been not been done long, can't you? You can see all the yeah. bits that they've ripped off the bark. Yeah, so this this would tend to be probably deer mm. uh, frame. Which is the horns, isn't it? Yeah, um, and then. You can see on one of these, yeah, if you look down here at the bottom, you see where the bark's been discarded. So that would tend to suggest that it's um, squirrel so it's done that. And you can see the teeth marks sometimes, can't you? Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, if these surveys can be done across the whole woodland, is, is there an age where the trees are too old to bother surveying? Um, well, typically they, the, the sort of ages that are suggested are that squirrel damage tends to occur between 10 and 40. Um, but I would say, you know, you, you probably see it a bit older than that. So if, if you've got, if the majority of your trees are around that, you know, 100 year old, then there's less likelihood that you're going to be affected by gray squirrel damage. Mm. There could be damage there, but it's not really going to cause a decline in the trees. Um, depends on the sort of age structure you might have younger trees with older trees so therefore you focus upon perhaps if you if you did your transect and your transect had say the eight closest trees and three of them were outside of that age range you might slightly twist your uh, your survey within reason i think that would be that would be acceptable uh, so the person got back to us and said it's been coppice so effectively clear <laughs> Okay, um, then yes, I mean, you'd probably, um, with it being coppice, you'd probably keep the stop and just zero it for the years until it becomes of a, a tasty age for the squirrel again. Because um, <laughs> in those first few years, they're not really going to bother with it. The deer might, but um, when this isn't a deer assessment. <laughs> um, can semi-accurate grey squirrel densities be determined from the damage surveys or are they just used as a relative comparison to other sites? Um, it's not really to do to, to, it's looking at uh, more damage i mean you might yeah. be able to get, if you've got a lot of damage you might be able to say that there's a lot of squirrels but there is a 
Um, there is a camera density survey methodology that's coming out that Sarah Beethan's been working on from APA. Yeah, say, so that's 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 pretty much the one for densities. I know they've been doing some work in the forest with the results due soon. So um, yeah, we we you'd need perhaps more of what I was mentioned about population monitoring and how squirrels are a bit difficult to spot or tell apart or make sure you've not spotted the same one about five times. Um, so that's why we've we've done the sort of tree damage um, again because trees don't move. That's always yeah. important. I think Sarah's paper is coming and going to be published fairly soon. Uh, so then you could potentially annually do you know this this damage survey alongside uh, a density survey and yeah. get a really good idea of what's going on with squirrels in your wood. I yeah. think that's. All the questions I can see. Um, so there might be a good point to wrap up the webinar. Um, Ed, do you have any last words? Um, well, thank you for everyone for, for listening in today. Um, if you do have any direct questions or feedback, then do get in touch. Um, we are going to be hosting a few in-person events. In-person events will mainly focus upon the presentation today, but also include a outdoor practical afternoon where we will go out and do some of these stops and have those discussions that we had around the pictures. Um, if you're a woodland owner, I would encourage you definitely to start this the sooner the better, start building that, that knowledge and that um, data of your own woodland. The woodland manager, I'd start trying to roll it out to your, your um, customers. And there is funding available. If you're in the forest, come and talk to me about management grant and getting woods into management. If you're outside the forest or in England, then uh, yeah, get on to uh, maybe a countryside stewardship scheme. Brilliant. Thanks yeah. very much, Thank Ed. You. And thanks everyone for joining us. Um, I hope you found this informative and useful and are able to build on this annual survey into your woodland management. Um, so enjoy the rest of this plant health week and uh, goodbye for now. <laughs>